Welcome to 2021. In this week's podcast, we're going to talk about some unsung heroes within the space world. That's right. Of course, there are thousands of unsung heroes, so every now and then, we're going to spend some time learning about some of them. And if you've heard the show before, then I'm sure you know this already, but come and find us on Twitter at Space and Things One or get involved at Space and Things Podcast on Facebook and that Instagram. It's always great to hear from you, so please do get in touch and let us know who your favorite unsung heroes are. But right now, it's time for episode 19 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. You're listening to the Space and Things Podcast with Emily Carney and Dave Giles. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 19 of our podcast. Happy New Year to you, listeners, and happy New Year to you, Emily. How are you doing? Yes. Great. Uh, Happy New Year to you as well. Uh, I'm hoping... uh Let's hope that things uh, improve this a- year. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's now it's my understanding that just before we started recording, you've been uh, you've been trying to become British. Yes. Yeah. I, I had a cat. Um, I somebody. Your, your accent hasn't changed yes. yet. That's what I'm going to say. Yes, we're recording the. I can't even do a British accent. <laughs> the pod. The podcast. The podcast. <laughs> That's how you say it. Um, yeah, somebody, I, I don't know, someone from the Netherlands sent me a bunch of British chocolate, you know. Fantastic. And um, yeah, I don't know who it is. Uh, I hope I didn't throw a card away or anything like that, but um, I just had something called the Cadbury Dairy Milk. So yeah, it was really good. I, I think it was just like a milk chocolate bar, but I really enjoyed it. Uh, the only Cadbury item we get in the United States uh, is the uh, the the eggs during Easter, and that's it. So it was pretty delicious. So yeah, I'm on my way turn, uh, to turn British right now. So I'm probably gonna have some tea later. <laughs> Whatever you guys do, I don't even know. I don't even know what you guys do. Yeah, that's that's all it is. <laughs> tea, s- scones. <laughs> yeah, it's not scones. It's scones. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely scones. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There's a congratulations in order here, Emily, as well, because uh, over over since we last spoke, um, Space Hipsters has hit twenty thousand members. Yes, it did. Yeah, that's a great milestone. Congratulations Thank on you. that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's. I'm pretty. Uh, I really don't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I see the number and I'm like, yeah, that's a great what? Like, I don't really believe that many people are in the group because I honestly had no idea that many people even like space flight. So that's yeah. pretty incredible. So, yeah, very, very big milestone. Really proud. Yeah. And it's uh, uh, when we've talked about it before and, and you're you're very humble on it, but the 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 kind of members that are in there as well. You've got people from all over the world. You've got people who have flown to space. You've got people who have worked on the rockets. You've got... People who worked in mission control. It's a really great group. It's like it's it's a wonderful collection of people, uh, in my opinion. So uh, good job on and well done to all the mods on all the hard work they do in there as well. Absolutely, yeah. They they really make it what it is, in my opinion. The members and the moderators really, because uh, I think yeah. I, I'm just the per, the person that pushed the button. So <laughs> that's how I look at. It. I'm just the poor sap who pushed the button. So someone's yeah. got to do it. Someone's, someone's got to do, do it. So. Yeah. Talking of pushing a button, you pushed a button twice already this year. You've had two blog posts out as well. Uh, one one on uh, this space available, and then you've launched your new new uh, blog as well. Yes. Uh, yeah, I launched the uh, the uh, making of an ex-nuke, which is a pretty direct plagiarism from uh, Brian O'Leary. So... <laughs> <laughs> But the, the blog post itself uh, uh, got uh, some pretty uh, good feedback, which I was really happy about. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, it was a blog post called uh, SpaceX, uh, Toxic Fandom <laughs> and Gatekeeping, which uh, you and I have already talked about on this show last year, uh, mm-hmm. late last year, probably a few weeks ago, really. Um, so we already talked a little bit about that. But uh, I was terrified, honestly, when I published it because I was expecting, you know, to get all sorts of harassment and flack from people uh, for writing that. But um, the feedback is really quite good. So, yeah. So I'm hoping to publish some more posts in that vein just to make people think. (laughs) Yeah. Well, in fairness, that's exactly what this blog post does. And if anyone actually has an issue with it, then then they're just kind of 
fulfilling what you're what you're saying they're doing so they you know they're meeting the expectation of being an idiot uh so hopefully people who read it who need to read it and learn from it are actually taking the time to stop and think about what they're doing yeah uh, because it's just getting ridiculous now isn't it and, and but i think it's a great uh great blog post great read i will obviously post uh post a link to that and your other one in the show notes thank you um but yeah, I'm excited for you about what's to come with this uh, with this new blog, and uh, good luck with it because uh, it's always exciting releasing something new. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, what are you up to? Uh, I, do you know what? My to do list is ridiculous at the moment. <laughs> uh, I had ten days off, and then like I don't normally have this much energy at the start of the year because December's normally gig 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 gig, yeah. followed by uh, well, it's interdispersed with social activity um and i'm just exhausted by the end of it but it's the 5th of january or whatever and i'm absolutely buzzing so i've got all these ideas and i've made this massive list that i clearly am not going to get everything done but i'm going to try so yeah yeah lots lots of things um planned and still working on on trying to get my next record made at abbey road so uh, awesome Talking of twenty thousand, I also hit twenty thousand. Twenty thousand pounds in my fund for that. So uh that's we both excellent. hit a twenty thousand of some sorts over the last few weeks. So that's um that's good well, news. That's great news. Yes, absolutely. But uh let this uh let's get cracking with the podcast, shall we? <laughs> let's crack on let's- then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, that was terrible. I didn't even sound British. <laughs> I sounded Australian. I don't even know what that oh was. My that God. was horrible. Do you know the amount, I'm sorry. amount of times I'm in America when I'm talking to people, they're like, oh, you from Australia, mate? And I'm like, no, abs- <laughs> absolutely not. I even knew you weren't Australian. <laughs> like, even I was like, I, he does not sound like he's from Australia. <laughs> yeah. I like it when American actors, I'll say this and then I'll shut up. American actors try to do British accents in movies and I'm like, why are they Australian all of a sudden? Like, what the hell? And then I'm like, oh, Jesus. Like, I, that's a real... British accents are really hard to do. Like, right, correctly. So, yeah, I'm not going to even try to do yeah, it. Yeah, I think it's, we have... It, for a small island, we have a hell of a lot of different accents and varieties. So, it, it, it's just confusing. Anyway, uh, let's crack on, shall we? <laughs> yes, let's crack on then. Flight crew, OTC, close and lock your visors. Initiate O2 flow. As always, we start with some news from the last week. Last week's show was pre-recorded, so we've got a couple of weeks to cover. There have been two launches, though. On December 27th, the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, or the CASC, launched a Long March 4C rocket, which is a three-stage rocket placing two satellites in orbit. This was the 34th successful orbital launch for the CASC in 2020, which is the most of any organization last year. Ariane Space also launched a Soyuz uh, rocket from French Guiana, putting a French satellite into orbit on uh, December 29th. And as always, there'll be uh, links to videos of those launches within our show notes. Please do go and check them out. Uh, And as we record this, we have yet to have a launch in 2021, Uh, but I'm pretty sure there'll be plenty to report very soon on that front. But moving away from launches... On December 26th, the joint US and European Solar Orbiter, which launched back in February of last year, flew past Venus for the first time. Uh, Now, in order to place the orbiter in a close orbit of the Sun, it's going to do a number of loops using the gravity of Venus to assist its trajectory. I think that's how that's working. And while the main aim of the orbiter is to spend seven years studying the Sun and giving us our first detailed views of the sun's poles, it does also contain some equipment to observe Venus on these flybys. Uh, No point in missing an opportunity to get some data. Um, And while they're not expecting to uncover anything too groundbreaking, and unfortunately there'll be no images, uh, they are looking to see how Venus interacts with solar wind. Um, Unlike Earth, Venus doesn't have a magnetic field, so the relationship with solar wind is very different to our planet. Um, So, yeah, this... It could be quite interesting to see how this develops, and I look forward to finding out more. Yeah, me too. That sounds really cool. Closer to home, on the International Space Station, NASA astronaut Kate Rubens harvested. Harvested? Why am I having trouble with this word? <laughs> I turned British. That's what the problem was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fresh radishes grown on board. Uh, it took 27 days for the 20 radish plants to grow in the Advanced Plant Habitat, or the APH, 
aboard the ISS, and there's a great time-lapse video available of them, which we will put in the show notes. Uh, now, this is a different kind of crop to, uh, to the leafy greens and uh, dwarf wheat, which were previously planted by the astronauts in the APH. And it's obviously uh, critical or crucial to the success of long-term missions that range uh, that a range of different types of crops are tested in microgravity. Now, uh, running alongside this, researchers have also been growing uh, radishes in the ISS environmental simulator back on Earth, so they can uh, compare the differences in the produce with those grown in microgravity. That so that would make sense. They would want a control group and a variable group. So that that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, this on the surface, this seems like such a simple experiment, but it's I am absolutely fascinated by this. Um, there, there's obviously so many things that, that we can learn, and it's such a simple like even for someone like me who's not I wasn't biology was not my strong point at school, but I can appreciate this experiment because it's quite obvious. Grow radishes in in microgravity. Are they different from radishes grown? With gravity, it's such a simple thing. Yeah. Let's look. Are they different? Do they look different on the eyes? Are they, what's the structure? Uh, and then there's other permutations, like what happens to the next um, next generation. I don't know if they're using the seeds from these radishes to try again. Um, but but again, just similar to <laughs> similar to the solar wind. These it feels like such a basic thing to be experimenting, but there's still so much to learn. Yeah, um, and yet. It's engaging at the same time. I'm excited by both of those stories. Oh yeah, there yeah, lots of unknowns. Yeah, and uh, and don't don't say that we don't give you all the juicy gro- gossip here on uh, on space and things. Uh, you know, solar wind and radishes. Yes, can't complain about yeah, that. Yeah, that's pretty that's pretty hot <laughs> news right there. Well, no, it, it what is, a start to yeah, the year. Very, yeah, I know everybody's like, was there a launch this week? What you know? But it's yeah. still pretty cool. Still pretty cool. Yeah, no, I, I think it's great. I think it's great. And finally, on New Year's Eve, a new law was passed in the United States called the One Small Step to Protect Human Heritage in Space Act. That's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> uh, this law requires that American companies and anyone working with NASA on new lunar missions avoid disturbing hardware that was left there 50 years ago. Uh, while the Artemis Accords, which have been signed by 10 countries so far, uh, not Russia or China at the moment, do include the, uh, the preservation of human heritage sites among its 10 guiding principles, it's not actually a law. So it's hoped that these other countries who have signed the Accords will use this law as a framework for their own laws. Um I've been following this for a while now. This has been talked about, especially in the run-up to the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 last year. This started to get a bit more traction about what to do with those heritage sites. Because if we are... I don't think we're anywhere near this yet, but if we are going to start having space tourists go to the moon, for example, surely there's going to be a race to bring back an artifact from those missions and do we want those sites to be tarnished in any way? You know, do we want to upset those footprints? Or that because there's a part of me that thinks do grab something and bring it back into the museum for more people to be able to see. But there's also a part of me that thinks they should be preserved. It's a it's a real tough one, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. For me, it's I'm kind of torn because there's part of me like, um, well, this isn't really the same issue because this happened over 50 years ago, but seeing those pictures of Alan Bean with like surveyor, I know, uh, and they brought parts of that back, you know, to earth. And, um, I, I was fortunate enough to meet Alan Bean a few li- a few times during his lifetime. And, um, every time I met him, I mean, I, I tried not to, you know, geek out and like, Oh my God, it's Alan Bean. But um, he's a he was a very nice guy. But I would always think, man, he stood next to another space, like a whole other spacecraft on the moon. That's so freaking cool. Like nobody can say they did this, you know, except this guy yeah. and Pete Comrade. And um, so I thought that was really cool. But in the same vein, I'm like, do I really want anybody messing with like, you know, Apollo 15's rover or something like that, or yeah. taking a selfie with it or just something? I don't know. I'm sort of torn because I'm like, you know, there's part of me that I, I there is that part of me that's interested in seeing, you know, OK, what happened to these things over 50 years? Can we bring something back and, you know, see how badly it degraded over time? You know, if we have, mm-hmm. you know, I'm sure we have the data from back then, you know, when it was manufactured and stuff to do a comparison. I don't know. I, I think about that stuff because I, I just it's something I think about, like. 
uh, I'm kind of in the process of thinking about um, writing about what if they reuse Skylab through the 80s. So I'm sort of in that mind frame right now, even though Skylab... Ah, we got our one Skylab min, uh, mission. There it, there it is. There it is. Counter. <laughs> we, <laughs> you've gone this many days with, you know, zero days. Um, no, but like I think about that just because I'm, I'm trying to do research and, you know, what would have happened if they had reused Skylab. And there were some, you know, concerns about, okay, how badly has it degraded up there, you know, over the past, I think it was six years at the time, five, six mm. years, which isn't a long time comparatively, but we're talking about 50 plus years here. So there is part yeah. of me that's kind of like mentally just like, mm, I understand, but I'm curious, you know? <laughs> I, I know it's different because uh, Mars and Mars and the moon are different and there's atmospheric dif differences and things, but it's kind of... <sighs> In, in an ideal scenario, you'd, you'd think, don't go anywhere near them, but can we send a drone there? And I know we don't have the technology to be able to send a drone, a small drone, to those sites whilst being on the moon yet. But I'm hoping that they can develop that, like a little camera thing, just to kind of go in and, and, and so we can see, get some more up-to-date visuals of what's happened to those things without disturbing them. But yeah, I, I'm very aware that that can't happen at the moment. But I remember reading last year that they, they, were, they were trying to get at least the Apollo 11 and Apollo 17 sites to be kind of cordoned off yeah, so that you couldn't couldn't go near them. So anyway, I think this law is good. Uh, I think it's I think it's a good conversation to be having, but ultimately I want to see I want to see the artifacts, but I want them preserved as well where they are. So I'm just super conflicted. Yeah, I kind of am too. In a way, because I'm sort of like, I, there's part of me that wants to see, okay, how badly did this deteriorate over time? Yeah. You know, because absolutely. that's something I sort of want to know, sort of that weird engineering side of me. Like, yeah. So, yeah. And also, I think that's going to need to be known Eventually, as well in some yeah. regards as well. Like, I think that's useful information as they're building uh, settlements, which they're hoping to last a number of years. Yeah. Um, but, but anyway... Uh, I'm sure that I'm sure they'll have those conversations where they need to. Yeah. But that's uh, that's that's the news over the last couple of weeks, and uh, I think I think that's the the main things. There's been some other smaller stories as well, but I will of course put links to those stories in the show notes if you want to read and find out more. Hey, traffic, we read you loud and clear, and uh, for your info, Flipper got a visual on you, and he also picked up surveyor. <laughs> hey, Oscar. Hey, where are we? <laughs> And so we enter our unsung hero section. Um, basically, we, Emily and I decided that we'd like to do this every now and then. Look at people that are often forgotten um, or that you may not have heard about because they're not Neil Armstrong uh, or Buzz Aldrin. So, and, and it doesn't just mean astronauts as well. And, and the, the, there's two people we're going to look at today. And, and you may have heard of them. You may not have done. But um, it, it does start with some sad news. So on, on Boxing Day, on the 26th of December, George R. Carruthers, who's an astrophysicist and engineer who designed the telescope which went to the moon on Apollo 16, uh, died at a Washington hospital age 81. And uh, we think it's a fitting time to bring him to your attention and to talk about his work. Yes, um, Dr. George Carruthers. In 2019, I wrote a piece for the uh, National Space Society, uh, Ad Astra, the magazine. At the time, I was like, man, you know, uh, we are, of course, as you mentioned uh, earlier, you know, everybody knows who Neil Armstrong was, right? Everybody knows who Buzz Aldrin was. But I mean, what about the there were 400,000 plus people who worked on Apollo behind the scenes that nobody probably ever heard about? Yeah. And who I believe are just as and I think the astronauts agreed as well that, you know, they're just as culpable for bringing, you know, Apollo to its fruition and to its full glory, really. And um, one mm -hmm. of them I, I selected was Dr. George Carruthers. Um, there's this wonderful book. It's by um, Richard Paul and Stephen Moss, and it's called The We Could Not Fail. And it's basically about the history of uh, African-American participation in the early space program, uh, which would be like, you know, Mercury, uh, pre-Mercury to Apollo, and uh, I think everybody needs to get this book uh, immediately. It's it's incredible. You know, I, 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 I'd like to think I know a lot of things about space flight, but there are gaps. And when I read this book, I was like, 
how come I don't know any of these people in here? Like, I don't know any of their yeah. names. I feel so, like, ashamed almost that I don't know who any of these people are because it's like, especially with Dr. George Carruthers, because he was really a huge trailblazer. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what he did during, um, uh, before, during, and after uh, Apollo. And uh, there is a famous picture of him. If you Google his name, um, you'll probably find it. It's on the NASA website, but it's a picture of Dr. George Carruthers. And uh, at the time, he was a scientist at the Naval Research Laboratory. He is uh, standing by a colleague uh, from the same uh, laboratory. Basically, the caption for the picture, I'm reading it right now, or reads, uh, three years prior to this uh, photo being taken, I think it was taken in 1972, um, he received a patent for the uh, far ultraviolet electrographic uh, camera, and uh, this obtained images of electromagnet, uh, radi- electromagnetic uh, radiation in short wavelengths. If you see the picture, it looks like a really blinged out camera or a telescope, a telescopic camera. It's uh, gold plated, it so it looks very unique. Doesn't look like any other type of uh, of hardware you've probably seen before. To my knowledge, it is um, one of the only observatories placed on the moon. Uh, It flew during Apollo 16, where uh, Mm. astronauts uh, John Young and Charlie Duke uh, placed it uh, in the Dakar Highland region on the moon. Basically, um, here's a quote from George Carruthers. Um, He said, quote, The uh, most immediate obvious and spectacular results were really for the earth observations because this was really the first time that the earth had been photographed from a distance in the ultraviolet uh, range Uh, so that you could see the full extent of the hydrogen atmosphere the polar auroris auroris which is like the um the uh, aurora basically how the um sun interacts with the poles and um what we call the uh tropical air globe belt So um, if you go Google this, you will find images of the Earth in ultraviolet from this mission. It's actually pretty cool. Um, Mm. I really believe, as uh, somebody who tries to look at, you know, the history of Apollo, this was probably one of the biggest uh, scientific coups of uh, Apollo, because I hate to say this, um, the focus of Apollo really was not science. (laughs) Yeah, It was not science. It was to get boots on the moon. And um, really yeah. only during the last three missions did they really, uh, 15, 16, and 17, did NASA sort of develop an interest in, okay, we want to investigate some of the moon's geological processes and, you know, and maybe put some other experiments on the moon that have some scientific purpose. This was one of the, you know, really one of the first steps in that direction other things that he did uh, in 1970, using a, uh, uh, I believe, an Aero B rocket, which is like an atmospheric uh, rocket. It's like a sounding rocket, basically. Um, Dr. Carruthers made the first detection of molecular hydrogen in space. Uh, this is according to his NASA bio. And um, in 1986, he also developed an instrument, a rocket instrument, that um, captured an ultraviolet image of uh, Halley's Comet. If you were alive, and I, I don't know, you probably do not remember this, but I, no, I, no, I, I, you were a baby. But I've read about, I've read about this. So yeah, in 1986, it was like Halley's Comet mania, and um, it yeah. was nuts. And I, I remember it. Um, unfortunately, Challenger was supposed to do, uh, uh, deploy some things that were supposed to observe it, which is sad. But that year, uh, there were quite a few different um, experiments in spacecraft that were um, observing it, and including, uh, I think, the Europeans had Giotto, which flew through its tail, yep. which is really freaking cool. Um, yeah, ridiculous. I saw that, and I was like, why couldn't we have done something like that? That's freaking, <laughs> I, that's badass, but I, I'm getting really off uh, track, though. That's really cool. But he also um, used an ultraviolet imaging uh, system to take pictures of it, which is really cool. He also uh, developed uh, an instrument, according to NASA, with two cameras uh, that had uh, different far ultraviolet wavelength sensitivities, which was used on uh, the space shuttle STS-39 mm. in 1991. And um, yeah, so he worked on a wealth of uh, ultraviolet imaging 
uh, projects, and he was really a trailblazer in that field. And uh, during the Obama administration, he was awarded the National Medal of Technology and Innovation, which is the United States' uh, highest honor for uh, technological achievement. He was also, I, I believe, involved in uh, endeavors for like students. Um, I know the, uh, I think it's the Association of Black Physicists. I think that's what the organization is called. Um, I, I They released a really nice uh, tribute to him as well. Um, it's kind of functions as an obituary, but um, I think he was involved in a lot of causes like that, which is basically to help fund, you know, uh, black students um, and help them go to college and help to, and help them achieve the these things that, you know, he helped, he achieved because he had an incredible career. Another tidbit, um, according to uh, James Oberg, he, he said this on Space Hipsters, uh, space historian James Oberg, um, I, I believe he said that um, Dr. Carruthers was a finalist in the 1978 astronaut class and he did not make it to the class, which I'm like, oh, wow. what kind of <laughs> what kind of competition was he up against? <laughs> Yeah. That he did not make it into that class. I mean, that's that's crazy to me because you look at this guy, and I mean, he achieved an awful lot by that point. So, um, mm. so that's another interesting tidbit, and that's a whole nother episode of people who didn't make it to astronaut didn't get, yeah. didn't get selected, but they still had really awesome careers. Yeah, I, I find this guy really really inspiring. So he was born in Cincinnati in Ohio, and uh, his father died in the early 1950s. And when you put it in perspective of the time he was alive uh, with losing his dad mm -hmm. and with the racial tensions going on in America, for him to have achieved what he achieved, I mean, it's, it's just incredible. I mean, he would have been one of the first black students to reach the higher levels of education uh, of his generation. And, and yet there was also battles. I mean, he was constantly having to fight... Uh, for what he wanted uh, while he was at graduate school in Illinois. Uh, he was frustrated because there was no mentors uh, to help him combine his passions of engineering and astronomy. Mm -hmm. and, and it's things like that. He was always having to fight to, to, to get to where he did. And then he ended up with a telescope on the moon. Yeah. Like that. It, it's just amazing. It's just incredible what, what he ended up doing. And and I love the fact that he he then became a mentor later in his life, and that was a big part of what he did. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's really quite something. And, and obviously that telescope, we got a lot, lot back from that. Yeah, we did. And it, and it nearly all went wrong because uh, Apollo 16 was 30 minutes late in its landing, um, and this telescope would only work if it was in the shade. Yes. Uh, so because of the delay in the landing, it was had less shade in which to operate in. Um, so even though it wasn't at full capacity, the amount of information we got from this telescope is absolutely fantastic. We're talking about people whose names you don't know who achieved beyond what they were what they should ever have been capable of. Uh, it, it, he's got to be way up there, yeah, and and rightfully remembered as well. Now, I found out about him. Um, he, I, I'm pleased to say he's featured as one of the five uh, Apollo v VIPs in a book called A History in Fifty Objects: Apollo to the Moon by Teasel Muir Harmony, um, which I've I read recently, uh, and I've I've mentioned it before on the podcast as well. Uh, which is a great it's yeah. a great book. You should check it out and and. They've got a whole piece about this telescope within that book um, because the Smithsonian actually has a replica of, of this telescope, which is yeah. fantastic. Weirdly, I happened to be picking up that book on Boxing Day without knowing that he had died. I was flicking through it. Wow. I know. It really freaked me out then That's when I really then found weird. out that he had died. I was like, And then what? I texted you and I was like, let's talk about him. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I was going to suggest it because it was just, there was so, everything was pointing me in the direction of we need to, we need to let people know about this guy. Yeah. Um, and, and, and find out and give him, give him the respect he deserves through our podcast. So um, Absolutely. Obviously, obviously he, uh, he reached the, the grand old age of, of 81, which doesn't feel so grand or old these days does it but um unfortunately yeah. i think it, it was dementia that was uh oh that, man which is which is horrific especially for someone whose brain is was so it fantastic was what yeah. a horrible disease and someone of course who we should be paying our respects to so i will be putting uh the details of those books which both i have mentioned and emily have mentioned in the show notes here's a uh another gratuitous uh skylab mention 
was there was a similar instrument, um, I believe designed by Carruthers as well on Skylab, which yep, imaged, I read that um, too, yeah. which imaged Kohutek, the comet Kohutek, yep. and uh, got some pretty. I've seen the image before. I, I, I'm sure if you Google, you Google it again, you'll be able to find it. But it got a pretty decent image of the uh, comet and some of its, you know, some of its features, you know. So, um, yeah, this guy did a heck of a lot, and he really, like you said, he really deserves. Um, his moment, you know, cause I, like I said, I read that book. Um, we could not fail. I read that a few years ago and I'm reading it and the whole book. I'm like, why haven't I heard of this person? This person is a freaking legend. Yeah. You know, I mean, cause there were a lot of people in the book who were like, yeah, I was the first person to do this. Or I was the first African-American ever to be allowed here, you know? And I'm like, why haven't we heard about, why isn't this person like in the newspaper or in you know, why aren't we hearing about this person more often, you know? And um, everybody needs to go read that book. That's all I got to say. It's an incredible book and very enjoyable. Too. I think there's some museums and historians that have to be careful since the Hidden Figures movie came out that the whole of uh, the African-American history within within NASA isn't just put on Katherine Johnson's shoulders. She yeah. was fantastic and wonderful, but there were other people doing things that were wonderful as well. And don't tick the box of saying, "Oh, look, we're inclusive. We've put a Katherine Johnson you put display one person up." On this. And don't and don't then include George Carruthers because his story, or Shelby Jacobs, yeah, or, or Shelby Jacobs, uh, whose stories are just as inspiring, but not turn into Hollywood movies. Yeah, he deserves a Hollywood movie. I think does, I mean, does, not absolutely. to take credit from Katherine. No, you know, no, 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 and, and that did. wasn't that no. wasn't the point. My point is the space yeah. for both, hundred uh, percent. But but museums need to be careful not to yes. not to go. Oh, we've done it now. We because did we this put Catherine- one box. We- yeah, we put this yeah. one person. Yeah, because I've seen stuff like that before. Where like, oh yeah, we're gonna do a women's exhibit, and I'm like, oh boy, and they'll put yeah. like a you know Sally, Sally Ride. Ride up. Yeah, <laughs> and I love Sally Ride. It's nothing against her personally, but it's no, like absolutely. There's a lot of other women who went to space or pioneered space flight as well, and they may have not gone to space. You know, absolutely. So I'm just kind of like, you know, you feel like they just okay, we got that token out of the way, so now we can move on with the rest of the exhibit. You know, and you're like, oh my god. So yeah, I totally, I totally see what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, there are plenty of stories we could we could bring up here, but this week. Um, we'd like to highlight the story of George Carruthers and pay our respects and offer our condolences to uh, his family and friends. A new man completed his first exploration of the moon. December 1972 AD. Carruthers is still the peak in which we came be reflected in the lives of all men. So following that story, um, this week in Space Hipsters, uh, space historian Francis French brought another person to our attention who neither Emily nor I had ever heard of before, embarrassingly, although I must have seen her on the TV as a child. For some reason, her name just didn't stick into my head. So I'm going to read his original post um, because he words it really well. He said, reading the Those We Lost end of year obituaries, this one of Heather Cooper I find moving and inspirational. Her appearance on British TV in the early 80s presenting astronomy shows was a breath of fresh air after the decades of unrelatable, fusty old men with ties and monocles. Uh, Young, enthusiastic, able to connect with families and with a deep academic background, she was the wave of the future. At a time when these battles are still being fought, it's heartening to remember someone who was doing this four decades ago and he posted a link to an obituary from her friend floella benjamin who i believe was an mp in the uk um and which i will put in the show notes for you uh, along with some other obituaries dr cooper passed away last february aged 70 after a short illness I'm embarrassed to say I wasn't aware of her by name, as I said, but I'm, as I, I must have watched something when she was uh, when I was a child of what she presented. Um, in 1965, she was 16 years old and wrote to the famed British television astronomer Patrick Moore. 
and asked if she would be able to take up a career as an astronomer. And she received a reply saying, being a girl is no problem at all. That's actually pretty awesome that he said uh, that. It, it is, but there's also it's also such a older man in the in the 60s way of putting it using the word girl, girl rather, rather than, than a young woman, woman. Yeah, right. I, I, there's an element of tokenism in the, in the way he's phrased it but yeah. i can imagine at the time equally being like that's cool i'm glad i've read that they gave me something <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly um so she w- she went on to study astronomy and physics at the university of leicester before becoming a postgraduate student at Oxford University. Uh, She was the senior lecturer at the Old Royal Observatory in Greenwich from 1977 to 1983 and left to become a writer and broadcaster where she had an extremely distinguished career. Uh, If you watch any classic astronomy TV in the the UK through the 80s and 90s, you would have most definitely seen her work. Uh, And as part of the Millennium Commission, which was a UK uh, thing set up in 1993, she was instrumental in making sure that the National Space Centre was set up in Leicester. Um, interestingly, she also applied to be an astronaut. She applied to be one of Britain's first af- astronauts and she got um, kicked off the list quite early what? on. Um, so it's interesting that, that both there's, of... Uh, yeah, there's <laughs> parallels there. That's crazy to me. We need to do a sh- more shows about people who just did not... like Because um, Gerard K. O'Neill was somebody who was you know pretty famous and um he got kicked off the he he didn't make it and i'm like huh like how did he that like what like when i found that out i was like they're they're mess they must whatever somebody you know that's crazy to me okay i got a little off thing but i'm like how did she not make it that's nuts yeah well i, I suppose we i mean where the time we only had space for one so and i think Hel- i think helen Sharman got it so I, yeah I, she did you know, yeah which, which is still pretty cool um but this is just someone, you know, this is an, uh, go, going with the parallels again with, with um, George Carruthers. Here is someone who had a lot of glass ceilings that she had to smash through. And she did it, you know, uh, in her academic career and also in a, in a presenting career. Um, she changed the face of, uh, of astronomy programs in the UK. And, and that's a big deal. And we shouldn't forget that. And and as Francis said in his post, um, at a time when there are so many issues with uh, with accepting women in places of science and yeah. engineering, we'll try to block you from even having access to it. it exactly. <laughs> I mean, for it, real. It, you know, we we should be um, looking at, at, at Dr. Cooper and her achievements and and recognizing them. Uh, and giving her her place as well, and and uh, alongside all of her peers. Uh, and I, as I say, I am embarrassed that I didn't know her by name, um, but I'm glad that Francis brought that to the attention of the group um, because I won't forget it. Yeah, that's for sure. I'm embarrassed to say I uh, obviously I, I'm not from the UK, so um, it's probably a little more understandable that I didn't know who she was. But um, I'm embarrassed to admit I didn't know who she was, but I know who Sir Patrick Moore is, which is kind of like. Yeah. That sort of speaks to how um, men have been really overrepresented in the sciences, and not to not to bag on Sir Patrick Moore. I, I do have some of his books, and I like his work. It's nothing against him. It's just, you know, why haven't I heard of her equally? You know, and um, absolutely, you know, it's yeah, and um, it's like uh, growing up in the nineteen eighties the first writers that I got interested in, you know, were, they were actually British writers. It was a, re- I'm probably not saying his name right, or Reginald uh, Turnell. It, sa- it sounds right to me, but have some more chocolate and you might say it better. <laughs> I might say it pro- <laughs> properly. But um, the first, you know, I think um, male space historians I really started reading when I was young was uh, Reginald Turnell, who's British, and Phil Clark, who's also British. And um, there weren't any women. Now, there yeah. were women space writers, just not in big numbers. Like, I wouldn't have heard of them, you know? So it's just, you know, that it kind of speaks to, you know, how underrepresented we really were. And, I mean, it's hard to be something when you're not seeing it. So I definitely think um, uh, Dr. Cooper, uh, her, uh, Heather Cooper's uh, presence, I wish I'd known more about her. And I do think her presence on TV, especially for, you know, young people you know boys and girls alike was probably you know a huge inspiration you know like 
oh, wow, you know, this is astronomy. Anybody can do this. You don't have to be a certain type of person, you know, kind of like the inspiration yeah. I got, you know, even though she wasn't a space writer, you know, I, I, I've talked about this before. I was a huge fan of Judy Resnick, you know, because she was like the first, you know, badass Jewish woman in space, you know, and she had all this mm. big hair. And I was like, man, you know, I want to be like that, you know, I want to have that spirit. And it's like that for me was a big, you know, representation moment because I'm like, okay, I'm seeing something that I might be, you know, or I could be. So I thought that was really cool. There's another side to this in the UK, a conversation is being had, especially in the media uh, about ageism as well. And um, particularly with women here, um, we see in the news or with um, specialist subjects uh, being presented on the media, we see men age. We see older men present in the news. We don't see as many older women. It's beginning to change, but uh, in the old days, a woman got to a certain age and they got the younger version in. And whereas someone like Patrick Moore could go right to uh, the end of his, you know, end of his career uh, as long as as long as he wanted to go. And it's nothing against him; he's done nothing wrong. He would, but why? Why was someone like Heather Cooper not given? As long as as long as an opportunity on the show as he was, yeah. Um, when she had, the, you know, it wasn't that she wasn't qualified, yeah. And in fairness, I don't know that she didn't walk away from it herself, but the stats from the way that the BBC has operated would suggest that probably wasn't the case. Yeah, but I'm, I'm uh, I may be being, I may be being unfair there, but probably not. Yeah, um, I think about that too because um, in the United States, and I'm sure you guys got this show too. Um, when I was growing up, we had a Cosmos with Carl Sagan, you know, on PBS. I think it came out around 1980. And um, I don't really remember us having, unless I completely missed something, we didn't have a woman like that on TV, like a woman science personality. In fact, I don't remember us having women science personalities until relatively recently. And um, mm. I love, I, I'm not dissing Carl Sagan. I like Carl Sagan. I like his books. I think he's a great writer. And he was probably the original, you know, great science communicator of the of that era. But it's just like we didn't see, there weren't many, there were some women on Cosmos, you know, and um, and I, I do want to give some credit to uh, Sagan's wife, Andrew Yan, who, uh, who also, you know, kind of, took up his mantle and, you know, promoted what he did beyond his death, you know, but, um, yeah, but we didn't have like a, a standalone person like that, you know, and Carl Sagan was like in his forties when he did Cosmos, you know, and, yeah. you know, he was in his mid forties. So back then he would have been considered like, okay, he's middle aged, but there was no problem with that, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, so as I said, I will post links to obituaries and to some other books that you can go away and do some further reading on both Heather Cooper and George Carruthers. And hopefully uh, you can be inspired by their stories and the things that they overcame uh, in order to be inspirations for us today. Absolutely. Yep. Let's uh, remember them for, uh, for all time. And the earth right out of front with us. So that's all we have time for this week. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this week's podcast. We'll be doing more of these unsung hero features uh, throughout the year and as this podcast progresses. Um, so please do let us know if there's anyone uh, you think we should be covering. And it don't have to be historical figures either. We, you know, um, There are still unsung people at all times who we could cover, working at all levels. If you know of someone who's got a good story you think we should know about, please uh, please let us know. Um, but once we've, once we've finished tonight, uh, Emily and I are going to start planning exactly what we want to try and do over, over the course of this year. Uh, and again, if you feel there's any things that, that we should make sure we should cover, please do get in contact and, and let us know. Yes, it would be great to hear from you. And uh, thanks for listening. And thank you to those who continue to support the podcast on our Patreon page. 
And uh, please go and have a look if you haven't done so already. The link is patreon.com slash space and things. Yeah, uh, a massive thank you to all who have got involved over there. Uh, and to those who hit the share button uh, once they finish listening to the, the podcast or leave us a review. Um, all of that really does help us out. But, you know, thanks for listening. And we hope to see you next week. But remember, in space, no one can hear you stream. Space and Things has been brought to you by and things productions.